Hi, welcome to Harvard Applied Math 205, a graduate course in scientific computing and numerical methods. I'm Chris Rycroft, and in this video, we're going to look at numerical sensitivity. We'll look at how errors can propagate through a numerical algorithm, and we'll also introduce the condition number, a fundamental definition that's used in many areas of scientific computing. In practical situations, we're almost always going to have input perturbations into our numerical calculation. And to think about this generally, we could introduce a function f that would take some input values x and produce some output values y. And we could then think about putting in a perturbed input, x hat equal to x plus delta x, passing that into our function and getting back a perturbed output, y hat equal to y plus delta y. And we say the function f is sensitive if the size of delta y is much larger than the size of delta x. And that's really a statement about the inherent properties of f that's independent of any approximation. So while that's useful, one issue that we have is that the scales of the input and output might, might actually differ. For example, perhaps our input is measured in terms of millimeters, where whatever we're getting out is measured in terms of kilometers. And if the scales are different, then comparing some small changes actually might not make that much sense. So the better way to approach this is to define what we refer to as the condition number. And here, we scale those input and output, output perturbations by the actual sizes of the input and output themselves. And that leads to a general definition where we say that the condition number is equal to the size of delta y divided by y divided by delta x over x. And so this is currently a very general definition, and this is also not precisely defined at present, because suppose x and y are vectors, then we need to define exactly what division means in this context. But this is a widespread definition that we'll see in many contexts throughout this course. And the one thing that is very nice about this definition is that we now have a dimensionless number, and if the condition number is much larger than one, then that tells us that small perturbations are amplified, and we refer to this as an ill-conditioned problem. Okay, so let's look at several examples now where we can calculate the condition number. And as mentioned, there are many situations throughout this course where we'll deal with mathematical operations that can be expressed as a function f applied to a collection of input values x that will yield a collection of output values y. What we're interested in is how does small change from x to x plus delta x affect the output. So what we can do is we can write that y plus delta y is equal to f of x plus delta x. And what we're interested in now is looking at the relative change in the size of the output delta y compared to the relative change in the size of the input, delta x. And this really captures the sensitivity of our function f. So what we can do here is we can define the condition number to be equal to kappa, which is given by the size of delta y divided by y over delta x divided by x. So this is a very general definition, and we'll have to specify exactly what we mean by the terms here, depending on the particular case of interest. In particular, we still need to define what the modulus operator here means. For example, if we were dealing with vectors, then this operator might represent a vector norm 
such as the Euclidean norm. Often we report kappa as the maximum over a range of permissible values. So let's now look at an example of calculating the condition number. And we're going to look initially at the case of a scalar function. So let x and y be scalars and f be a real differentiable function. So we have something like this here where we have our x and our y, and then we have a function that looks like this. And what we're interested in then is if we have a value x, and that goes to x plus delta x, then our value y will change to y plus delta y. So we're interested now in calculating the condition number. And the first thing that we can look at is the calculation of delta y over y, which we can write as y plus delta y minus y over y. And that can be written as f of x plus delta x minus f of x over y. And the top part starts to look like a derivative here. So what we'll do now is we'll introduce the factor of delta x on the bottom. And we'll also introduce a factor of delta x on the top to cancel it out. And so now we've got a term that approximates the derivative of f at x. And that allows us to write down that this is approximately equal to f prime of x times delta x divided by f of x. And from here, we can write down that the condition number is approximately equal to the magnitude of f prime of x times x over f of x. So this makes a lot of sense here. We see that the value of kappa is proportional to the size of the derivative. And that means that in places where the function varies rapidly, the condition number will be larger. We also see that this will work out to be dimensionless. We have a value of f on the top and a value of f on the bottom, and they'll cancel each other out. We also have a length scale coming in from the x, and that will balance the derivative scale coming in from the f prime. So this is indeed a dimensionless number. Okay, so now let's look at a second example of matrix multiplication. We're going to take some input vector x and apply a real invertible matrix to it, and that will give us an output vector b. And this maps onto our previous problem, but with a taking the role of f and b taking the role of y. So now let's consider a small change in the input vector from x to x plus delta x. And so what we can do is we can write down that b plus delta b is equal to a times x plus delta x. And so here, for this specific case, we can make use of linearity. And that allows us to cancel the b on the left-hand side and the ax on the right-hand side. And we therefore end up with the equation delta b is equal to a times delta x. So for this case, we can write down that our condition number, 
is equal to kappa equal the norm of delta B divided by the norm of B divided by the norm of delta X divided by the norm of X. And so here the norm could represent any particular vector norm of your choice. But for simplicity, we can often focus on thinking of it as the Euclidean vector norm, just measuring distances in Euclidean space. So to proceed, we'll write down that kappa is equal to the norm of A delta X over the norm of delta X times the norm of X over the norm of A X. So this is looking good, but the one issue that we have here is that we're trying to say something about A and its inherent properties, whereas currently this formula also involves these delta X and X terms. And so we'd really like to be able to measure something about A itself. And so to do this, we're going to introduce the idea of a matrix norm. Which is going to be defined as the norm of matrix A is equal to the maximum over all non-zero vectors of V of the vector norm of A of V divided by the norm of V. This will give us a expression for a matrix norm and a way to measure the size of matrices. And this will be a mathematically valid norm. And in particular, we refer to this here as the induced matrix norm. Any vector norm will induce a corresponding matrix norm. So maybe this could be the Euclidean norm. There could also be some other norm as well. Now, to proceed from here, we'll write down that kappa is less than or equal to the matrix norm of A times the vector norm of X divided by the vector norm of AX. And the way that we've done this is we've replaced this A delta X and delta X term with the maximum bound coming from our matrix norm definition. So we're making progress here, but we still have to deal with these two terms. And we've still got the X here. But now let's rewrite that X is equal to A inverse of B. And if we do that, we know that kappa is less than or equal to the norm of A times the norm of A inverse B divided by the norm of B. And again, we can replace these two terms using our matrix norm expression. So we can, this will give us the norm of A times the norm of A inverse. And so we end up here with a very nice expression for bounding our condition number. We've got these two terms here that come together. We've got the matrix norm of A multiplied by the matrix norm of A inverse. And so together they will give us a dimensionless number. And that's very nice because it removes the scales in the problem. So let's now look at the third example. Okay, so for matrix multiplication, we took an input vector X and we applied a real invertible matrix A to it to get an output vector B. And we show that the condition number satisfies kappa is less than or equal to the norm of A multiplied by the norm of A inverse. And this is independent of X and B. So now we're going to look at a third example of solving a linear system, which is closely related to the previous case. Here, we'll take an input source term F and we'll have a real invertible matrix C and we'll solve for an output vector of unknowns. 
and you'll see that between these two problems, the role of x and f is reversed. So rather than solving this problem from scratch, what we'll do is we'll connect it to the previous case. So to do that, we will map this onto the previous example by defining C equal A inverse, F equal X, and Y equal B. So these definitions allow us to convert our problem back into matrix multiplication, but using A inverse. And following the derivation in the previous example, we can immediately write down A bound for kappa we find that kappa is less than or equal to the norm of A inverse times the norm of A inverse inverse. And that is equal to the norm of C multiplied by the norm of C inverse. And so by doing that, we show that we get the same bound as before we find that kappa is now less than or equal to the norm of C times the norm of C inverse. So the condition number is often reported as the maximum value over a range of permissible inputs. And since this bound occurs both for matrix multiplication and also for solving linear systems, we often define the condition number for a matrix to just be equal to this bound. So kappa is just equal to the norm of A multiplied by the norm of A inverse. And this is used in many scientific papers in the field. And it's also computed by condition number functions in software libraries such as numpy.linarch.cond in Python and the cond function in MATLAB. Okay, so this is a useful definition, but to calculate kappa, we need to be able to evaluate matrix norms. And we want to know how we can do that. It's not so obvious given that we have to take this maximum over all possible vectors v. So to look at this, we're going to look at a simple example here. Of a two by two invertible diagonal matrix. So let's write that our matrix A is equal to alpha and beta on the diagonal and zeros in the off diagonal terms. So let's also impose that the size of alpha is greater than or equal to the size of beta. Okay, so now we're going to try and evaluate this expression for the norm of A for our given matrix example. So the first thing that we can do here is we can write that a general vector V in polar coordinates is given by V equal R cosine theta, R sine theta, where R is from 0 to infinity and theta can be from 0 to 2 pi. Then the norm of A is taken over the maximum of permissible values of R, 
So we restrict to have non-zero r and all possible values of theta. And we can now explicitly write out what these vectors will be here. So in the numerator here, we'll have alpha squared, r squared, cosine squared, theta. And we'll also have beta squared, r squared, sine squared, theta. And on the denominator, we'll have r squared, cosine squared, theta plus r squared sine squared theta. So now we'll get some simplifications. We see we've got cosine squared theta and sine squared theta, and they will combine together. We've also got factors of r that will cancel away. So now we can simplify this. We can remove the, the range of r completely and just look at theta. And that will now give us on the, in the numerator alpha squared cosine squared theta plus beta squared sine squared theta. And the bottom will completely go away and we'll just end up with the square root of one. So to proceed, let's now use a trigonometric formula. And what we'll do here is we'll replace the cosine squared theta with a sine squared theta. And that will now go as the alpha squared minus alpha squared minus beta squared sine squared theta. So now, since alpha squared minus beta squared is greater than zero from the condition we imposed on alpha and beta, we know then that this will be maximized when theta equals zero. So the second term in the square root will vanish in that case. And hence, we know that the norm of A will just be equal then to the magnitude of alpha. And so if we think about A as a linear transformation, we can see that the norm of A is really picking out the direction that is stretched the most, this value of alpha. So now, Let's look at the inverse. And so here, A inverse will be given by alpha inverse and beta inverse on the diagonal. And in this case, we know that beta inverse will actually be of larger magnitude. So if we now apply the same argument as before, then we will get that the norm of A inverse will just be equal to the magnitude of beta inverse. And so that will now give us an expression for the condition number of the matrix A that will just be equal to the magnitude of alpha times beta inverse. We see here that kappa works out to be the magnitude between the largest diagonal term, alpha, and the smallest diagonal term, beta. And if we looked at larger diagonal matrices, this result would still be true. We also see here how kappa captures the range of scales in our matrix. In this example, we can actually see that alpha and beta are the eigenvalues of the matrix A. And this is sometimes rather useful intuition about what exactly the condition number is capturing. But unfortunately, this is not always the case. And if we start to look at non-diagonal matrices, then there is no longer this perfect agreement. And to understand this further, we'll wait until unit two. And we'll actually find, as a sneak peek, that the condition number is given generally in terms of singular values a related but different concept to eigenvalues. So in practice, we solve problems by applying a numerical method to a mathematical problem. For example, you may have heard of Gaussian elimination, which is a numerical algorithm for solving matrix systems like AX equal B. To obtain an accurate answer, there's really two things that we require. We require that our numerical method is stable, and we require that our mathematical problem should be well-conditioned.
So we've spoken about conditioning, but we need to still define what we mean by a stable numerical method. And roughly speaking, we want that the errors in the method do not accumulate over time. So we'll make this definition more precise, but to do so, we first need to look at finite precision arithmetic, and we need to look at how rounding error accumulates on typical computer hardware. And this will be covered in the next video.